In this video, I want to spend a short time looking at how condensed phase models can be employed to get at more complex phenomena than simply gas to liquid partitioning. And so, uh, in particular, I'll look at various kinds of phase-phase partitioning and talk about how one might use, I'll focus primarily on continuum models, uh, in order to make predictions about that phenomenon. So what are the phases that one might be interested in? Up, up till now, we've really discussed a molecule, this looks like it's methanol, going from the gas phase into a liquid solution, and that free energy of salvation is defined by the equilibrium between these two, and that is Henry's constant. So you get an absolute free energy of salvation, you specify your standard states, you get a number, that's the way uh, thermal chemical properties work. Okay, so you could have any solvent you want. However, what if the liquid into which you're dissolving is actually methanol? That is, it is the pure solute in its liquid phase. So there is an equilibrium associated with methanol in the gas phase and the pure methanol liquid. We don't usually refer to that as a self-salvation for energy, although we could. We actually usually express it in somewhat different units. We express it in pressure units. So uh, you certainly can do Henry's constant in pressure, it, it is, but uh, we would refer to a vapor pressure here. So vapor pressure is a measure of the free energy of self-salvation. Uh, of course, if you combine these things, that is, if you think about leaving a pure liquid going to the gas phase, running over here, and dissolving into a different liquid, that would define solubility. So that free energy transfer from pure phase to other solution is uh, usually described in solubility units. Of course, it's a free energy. And then finally, we could imagine transferring a solute molecule from one solvent to another solvent. There is a free energy, which will dictate the population of molecules in the two different solvents. And again, usually not necessarily written as a free energy, instead described with a partition coefficient. So all of these different ways to describe populations, mind you, equilibrium constants, we know how to relate that to free energy from simple thermodynamics. So you also can look at interface adsorption. So that's where instead of going into a, a phase, you might adsorb onto the surface of a phase. You can look at going through a membrane. So maybe this phase is narrow. And so you pass from one phase into a second phase to yet a third phase on the other side. All of these things can be addressed with continuum solvent models. And I'll show you a couple examples. So let's first look at partition coefficients. That's a that's a particularly simple one in a sense. If you're interested in the free energy to transfer from solution one to solution two, then you can immediately use a continuum solvation model to do a gas phase calculation, compute the solvation free energy into one solvent, compute it into the other solvent, and because free energy is a state function, the difference between those two is this. And so that's a, a pretty straightforward calculation. Here's a quick example of actually doing that for a series of uh, unnatural nucleic acid bases. So all of these heterocycles, some, some of them are natural and others are unnatural. So these heterocycles differ by substituents or groups or atoms at the positions that are in the circles and the ovals. So for instance, 9-methylguanine going to 2-amino-9-methylpurine, that consists of removing this oxo group and replacing it with a hydrogen and uh, balancing uh, this, this is no longer an amide, so it doesn't have a hydrogen on it. 9-methyladenine itself involves moving, relative to this species, involves moving this amino group from the 2 position to the 6 position. And so all of these differ from one another in, in some uh, various way. And the question is, how do they partition between two solvents? And while that may seem kind of esoteric, let me explain why that might be interesting to, uh, let's say, the pharmaceutical industry. So in order for a drug to get to a target, typically it has to partition out of an aqueous medium and get through or into a lipid-like medium and then partition out of it again. And why do I say that? Well, most people would not like to have things injected into them. They would much rather swallow a drug.
So when you swallow something, it goes into your intestines, it's in there with uh, sort of, maybe you drank a lot of water, let's call that aqueous. It needs to get through your intestine, the villi, uh, which are membranes. So it can't love water too much compared to lipids, or it'll never get into the villi. On the other hand, if it loves lipids too much, it just sits in the membrane, and it never then goes back into the bloodstream, where it'll be transported along and perhaps diffused through a cell membrane, which is again lipid-like. So we need to do this crossing, even if it is injected actually, if you want it to be systemic and carried by the blood to different places, you're gonna to have to get through cell membranes. So the pharmaceutical industry wants bioavailable drugs to have a certain profile of partitioning between polar and nonpolar phases. In order to do an experiment, you might assume that you could correlate that partitioning in biophases to something simpler that you might do in the lab, which would be a pair of solvents meant to mimic those phases. And so uh, some experiments that have been done with these natural and unnatural uh, nucleic acid bases is to look at the partitioning between chloroform and water. So chloroform less polar than water, and these are experimental values, and they're as log k units. So this is an equilibrium constant and a the common logarithm thereof. And I've highlighted a few of these where predictions were made before they were measured. In fact, the measurements were inspired by somebody going and reading the predictions. And if you look at these, this is from an older generation uh, salvation model at the University of Minnesota, SM 5.4, based on the AM1 Hamiltonian. So here's an example of a semi-empirical calculation. Uh, these are the computed values. If it's bold face, that means a measurement uh, was available at the time. And if it's not boldface, the measurements weren't there at the time. And the bottom line is that the mean unsigned error is about seven-tenths of a log unit. So that's about one kcal per mole or so. And that's reasonable performance. If you look at any one of these numbers, uh, they all do okay. And of course, there's some largest error. It's probably this one. But it uh, is interesting to note that, uh, for instance, if you compare one methyl uracil to five bromo one methyl uracil, so that consists of replacing a hydrogen atom with a bromine. And the original prediction says that if you work out what the sign means here, it says that 5-bromo is more hydrophobic. It spends more time in chloroform than it does in water than 1-methyluracil. And actually, the experimentalists who uh, read the paper found it hard to believe that a, a bromine atom would be hydrophobic. They thought it would be hydrophilic. So they went and they did the measurement, and they found that, sure enough, it is hydrophobic, a little bit less than was predicted by the salvation model, but that was a pleasant example of a prediction being subsequently confirmed by experiment. Now, let's uh, take that same idea of the free energy cycle, but let's make one little change, and that is the solution on the left is no longer an arbitrary solvent. It's actually the pure liquid phase of the solute we're interested in. And so now I can either calculate the vapor pressure, if I express it in pressure units, for solute A, or I can express the solubility of A dissolving into some solvent as the sum of these two free energy steps. And usually that'll be measured in some solubility constant. So here, again, a, a salvation model from Minnesota, the uh, SM5.42, and R means uh, frozen geometries from the gas phase, so not re-optimized. This is the mean unsigned error and predicted vapor pressures expressed as log units, a whole bunch of different kinds of solvents where these vapor pressures are known, 75 different ones, and uh, this particular salvation model can be used with Hartree-Fock theory, with AM1, with B3LYP, and in every case, it has roughly a similar performance, and the mean unsigned error is only three-tenths of a log unit in vapor pressure, which is uh, you know, reasonably good. And then if we go and look at uh, predicted errors in solubilities, effectively for the liquid solutes, for solid solutes, so that's, that's treating the solids as though they're supercooled liquids when you do the, the vapor pressure step. So that in itself is an approximation, and it's interesting to ask how well it works. And actually, it, it works pretty well. Of course, partly that's because these solids are relatively simple. They're things like anthracene and big aromatics. But same sort of 0.3 to 0.5 log units error in solubility. And if we compare that with a... There's a popular model to compute solubility that comes from the chemical engineering literature. It's called UNIFAC. Uh, 
and it's a group contribution approach. So it sort of says a, a given functional group will have a certain effect on solubility that is very transferable. And what you see is the, the quantum mechanical continuum solvent model is doing a little better than Unifac, although actually it's almost entirely tied up in the hydrocarbons, and uh, Unifac's just pretty bad for hydrocarbons. That's well known in the field. People usually don't care that much about the hydrocarbons, so it hasn't been tweaked so much. But in any case, very competitive model and useful for computing these uh, macroscopic properties like vapor pressure and uh, solubility. Now, if we do something a little more exotic, let's think about membrane water partitioning. So here's a case that gets closer and closer to that pharmaceutical uh, application I alluded to earlier. So how do you actually measure this experimentally? Typically what you do is you prepare some vesicles in aqueous solution, for example, and you make the vesicles in such a way that their interior volume is negligible, and then you toss in a solute, a little star in this case apparently, and the solute partitions. Some is in the water, some is in the vesicle. And then with a micro syringe, you sample the aqueous phase without pulling up any vesicles into it, and you know how much you put in, and you know what the concentration is in the water phase, so that leaves the remaining concentration in the vesicle phase. As long as you know the volume of your vesicles, you're done. You've got an equilibrium constant. You can define a free energy. So uh, what do you do in order to do a calculation? Well, it's a partition, so we want to compute the free energy of salvation into water. We've discussed how to do that extensively. And then you want to compute the free energy of salvation into the membrane. So you need some model for the membrane. So the case I'll show you some data for is a membrane of phosphatidylcholine. And so you can ask yourself, hmm, I wonder if I'll find tables of the index of refraction for phosphatidylcholine as a liquid, or the alpha or beta value, or the dielectric constant. And the answer is actually no. So what, what do you have to do? Well, you can either just make your best guess, basically. And so you look at various functionalities in here, and you pick some numbers. And so uh, the best guess from a bunch of chemists who worked on this problem are shown here. And an alternative approach is to take a body of data. So you know what the partitioning data are. You know all the parameters for water. And you can actually then backfit what would be the optimal parameters for phosphatidylcholine that best reproduce the experimental data because the unknowns now are the epsilon, n, alpha, beta, gamma values for the membrane phase. If you actually do that, you get the values shown here from a regression. The things in parentheses are because this was held at zero. There's definitely no hydrogen bond donor in phosphatidylcholine. Uh, this has to be done by hand because it's not linear in the dielectric constant. But in any case, you see great agreement. So it's either an indication that uh, chemists have good intuition or that the model has some sensibility to it because you get sensible numbers out. There's also finally a little constant term and that has to do with uh, the way things can sort of stick in a membrane while still sticking a hydrophilic part out. So stuff that's in the membrane might not like it quite as much as it appears. It's just burying a component of itself in the membrane, but that still means it's unavailable for sampling when you sample the aqueous phase. So just to show some data, here's a bunch of molecules where uh, the partitioning between phosphatidylcholine vesicles and the aqueous phase was measured. And this is a plot of experiment against prediction. And so this is a pretty typical, what I, what I like to call a, a drug company plot. So R squared, only 0 0.795. So to a physical chemist, appalling. But uh, to somebody who might make several billion dollars for the stockholders by picking a compound that has this sort of profile as opposed to one that has this sort of profile when it comes to bioavailability, it's helpful to have this sort of prioritization. So this model can now be used in order uh, to predict properties for molecules that are not readily available for measurement and it may prioritize synthetic targets. I'll wrap up with a still harder phase-phase partitioning, but one that's really critical in the environmental chemistry arena. And so the partitioning we're interested in is the partitioning between water and soil, and more, more prosaically, dirt. And, uh, you know, on the one hand, it seems sort of odd that this would be a value that one would measure or tabulate, 
And the oddity arises because what exactly is the standard state of dirt? What defines standard dirt? And you might be surprised to hear there is, in fact, an American Chemical Society reagent grade standard dirt. It comes from the Suwannee River uh, sediment, uh, and you can buy it from your favorite chemical company. But the reason that there is a standard is dirt has a certain amount of carbon component. So dirt varies all over the world, obviously. If you go digging in Georgia, you get a bunch of clay, and there's hardly any organic in it. If you go digging in Ireland, in a peat bog, that's almost 100% uh, organic carbon, huge amount of carbon. That's why people made charcoal out of it. So if you simply normalize the soil you dig up, I'll stop saying dirt, stay soil, uh, for its organic carbon content, so take concentration in soil, normalized by how much of the soil is organic carbon, then you can define a value called KOC, which is the partitioning between water and the organic carbon component, that is remarkably constant across a wide variety of soils. And clay, loam, peat I have listed here. And this is a hard uh, quantity to compute, in part because the molecules involved that you'd be interested as an environmental chemist are really quite complex, very unusual functionalities, phosphonothioates that come from, say, pesticides, polyhalogenate aromatics that have made their way into the environment, what I like to call horrible molecules. So again, uh, one needs a model for the partitioning. One needs to come up with the universal solvent parameters for, for soil. Now, it turns out the best chemists around at the time did not actually have great intuition on that necessarily and didn't even try to make a guess, but just followed the fitting procedure I outlined to you a moment ago. And that regression fit gives these values. And if you look at them and think about the kinds of functionalities that actually make up the organic component to soil, they're all pretty reasonable. You can, you can wave your hands pretty easily on these sorts of things. And over a large data set, including many of those horrible molecules I mentioned, this particular... Uh, soil model, which again is a, a Minnesota model using hartree fock with a midi-bang basis set, SM5.42R is the name of the salvation model, gives a mean unsigned error of one log unit. So not quite as good as some of the other calculations, but the molecules have become substantially more complex. Knowing that partitioning can be very helpful for understanding uh, environmental fates. How long does something stay in the environment? How readily does it move from one place to another as opposed to just sticking into a soil? And uh, that's the utility of that model within environmental chemistry. Just to illustrate the application uh, and maybe uh, sort of food for thought where a physical organic chemist might be interested, here every data point on this graph is a polychlorinated biphenyl. So you can have multiple chlorines, 1 to 10, uh, when there are less than uh, 10 and more than 0. There can be stereochemistry. So these are the various polychlorinated biphenyls. And this is the calculated KOC value below and the experimental KOC value above. And what you see is that the computational model does a beautiful job of predicting the variation as a function of substitution. It does have a constant offset. It gets everything wrong by about one log unit. But it's much more useful for understanding changes. And so knowing that, one could then go in and look on an atom-by-atom -atom basis. Why do chlorines in some positions contribute more to hydrophobicity, if we think of sticking to soil as hydrophobicity, than others? And uh, could that be useful in making predictions about other molecules? Okay, well that wraps up my phase-phase partitioning story. In uh, the last video in the Salvation series, we're going to look at what might seem like sort of a logical step to take, which is to try to... Uh, take the best of both kinds of solvent models, explicit and implicit, and combine them in a way that achieves the greatest bang for the buck. So we'll see that next.